So I have a bunch of team members behind me. I'm going to let them introduce, uh, introduce themselves. Um, and they're also going to give you guys one tip for tournament golf. Um, so hopefully one, of, one thing that these players will say will resonate with you and help you guys in your next tournament round, maybe this weekend, or if you're not playing this weekend and you're just spectating, uh, whenever you do get out there. And it even can uh, resonate into your practice rounds and your casual rounds with friends. So um, these tips go a long way. Um, I'll go last, so we'll start off with our boy Miles Seaborn. Go in the opposite direction. <laughs> you're, you're on my left. Oh, okay, all right, all right. All right. Well, I'm Miles Seaborn, um, obviously a member of Team Dynamic Discs. Um, I'm from Logansport, Louisiana, a little town with no disc golf, so I'm working on that currently. Um, but my, my tournament tip is if you are doing something really well, like if you're throwing hyzers really well or you're throwing flat shots really well, do that in the tournament. Consistency is key. Um, if you're uncomfortable with the shot, don't intentionally try to throw it. Tournament time is not time to work on things. It's time to do what you know you can do well, and that way you'll score better. Uh, I'm Peter McBride from San Luis Obispo, California, and I grew up uh, throwing Sinsheimer Park there, short little nine-holer. There's a pretty solid disc golf community there. My, uh, my tip is to don't forget to breathe when you're playing a tournament. If you are thinking about the, uh, your, the shot you just missed, the putt you missed, or even the putt you just made, you're not focused on the, your next shot and you're not going to be able to execute it how you want, want to. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dixon Jowers. My park where I kind of learned disc golf was just up in Fort Worth at, uh, at Zebos. I don't know if how many of you guys have played that, but that was, that was where I learned disc golf. And actually, I got to play the very first tournament ever at this, uh, at this course when it first went in. So I've got a lot of love for Waco disc golf. And my first win ever was an intermediate out at Woodway um, in 2001. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of uh, Waco love. Um, my tournament tip for you guys. Uh, um, so... Growing up, I was hardly ever the best athlete at any sport, and so I always tried to think better than the other people, right? So in disc golf, there's lots of shots that I don't have, but one, one, one thing I can't control, and this will seem silly until you try it the first time, change your socks in between rounds. Your feet will feel totally fresh, and you'll have a much better outlook about the second round. You're giggling. I promise you, the next time you play a two-round tournament in one day, change your socks, your socks between rounds, and you're going to think about me and say, Hey, my feet feel pretty good right now. I promise you. I promise you. And then you send me a message, and we'll talk about it. Oh, Lord. Here we go. On the box. He's got a great podcast. He's doing great things for disc golf. Hi, everyone. I'm Don Ellsworth. Everybody knows me as Giggler. I'm not too good at this, talking on this mic and stuff, so it's going to be real quick and simple. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. That's where I learned to play disc golf. I uh, moved to Allen, Texas. I do reside there, and... I do have a nine-hole course there. I play there probably every day, every afternoon. Uh, the only tip that I could give you <laughs> is <laughs> have fun and always smile and stay focused. I like it. Nice. Hey. Hi, boy, <laughs> Hello, I'm AJ Risley from San Diego, California. Um, been playing disc golf for about 14 years now. And my tip for tournament players is one thing that I noticed when I started to elevate my game more was putting in work on days like today. And so my tip for everybody is to come up with a strong game plan when you're thinking about playing big tournaments. Go out to the course, you know, a day, maybe two days before, and really study everything that's going on and come up with a you know, a set of shots off of every tee and approaches to every basket that fits your game the best that you can feel comfortable in that and confident in when it comes time to play the tournament where you don't have any mulligans or anything like that. So, thank you. It's a really fancy mic, Bobby. Good, good job here. My name is Paige Pierce. I'm from Plano, Texas, born and raised. Um, right by Giggler, actually, about 10 minutes away. Um, I would say my best tournament tip I could give, I think, would be just to take what, what you're given. Uh, you know, we all want to go for the birdie off the tee pad, but if you mess up off the tee, sometimes that birdie's not feasible anymore. So, you know, play for par. Um, and don't be afraid to lay up. Sometimes the wind gets too strong. Your putt's going to go over the basket. Don't be afraid to lay up. And same goes if 
you're back in the beast in the woods and you get off the fairway, you don't have to try the hero shot to progress very far. Just get out of the woods and go from there. Um, I'm Tina Stenitis. I'm from a small town in Wisconsin called River Falls. Um, I like to claim Portland, Oregon as home because it's not as cold. Um, <laughs> and I also learned on a tiny nine hole. That seems to be kind of where everybody starts. Um, my biggest helpful tip for tournament golf specifically is really treating your tournament shots like they're casual shots. Um, I personally am better at accessing uh, that commitment better if I can think about it. How would I throw this in a casual round? Because I'd commit to it and not be worried about if I can't str like struggle for par, if I can't get to the place that I wanted to. It's just easier for me to look back and go, all right, how would I throw this exactly like I would in a, in a practice round? And it takes that stress and pressure off, and you can just commit to your shot easier. Great. All right. Hey guys, my name is Robert McCall. I uh, started playing disc golf in Abilene, Texas at Cal Young Park. If you guys have been up there, you know it's uh, the best. Uh, but then more recently, I lived in Austin, so I've played several, uh, several tournaments here at Waco, know a lot of Waco players. And then uh, even more recently than that, moved to Emporia um, to manage Team Dynamic Discs. So if these guys are giving you any trouble, holler at me. I will make sure they pay for it or something. Um, something like that. Uh, my tournament tip for you is um, that if, if you're a person whose mind gets racing at the course and, and you find yourself at the end of the round um, being really mentally, mentally fatigued, uh, the thing that helps me the most instead of analyzing things after I've let my tee shot go and while I'm walking down the fairway wondering, like, am I going to have a putt? Well, if I make this, I'll be sitting at this score, whatever that is. Instead of that, I just focus intently on my shot for 10 to 20 seconds, however long it takes me to throw the shot, and then just let my mind wander after that. And then once I get to my next shot, focus again and then let it go. Um, at the end of the rounds, I find myself a lot more uh, refreshed than, than a lot of my competitors who have just been like, the whole time. Um, and yeah, it just helps me to commit for the whole round and the whole tournament. So something to try out for sure. Awesome. And I'm Eric Oakley. I grew up in Grapevine, Texas, just in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, I played a course that is no longer with us, Bear Creek Park, which was a, a great little course. Um, and it was a place where I really fell in love with disc golf. Uh, I had a good soccer buddy who helped me uh, find the sport. And, you know, here I am. Uh, the, the tip I have goes along with, a, a, it goes to life. It's always believing in yourself. No matter what the situation is, believing that you can achieve it. You can achieve, all right, cool, I need to lay up out of the woods. I'm going to achieve this like a pro. Bam, lay it up. Especially out here, you're going to have to lay up. But if it's, I have to hit this tiny gap, I'm good enough to do it. I've practiced it, so now I have to believe in it. And once you have that belief, it, go, it, it, it spreads into your game. You're able to execute the shots and uh, hopefully lower your scores. Um, that goes to putting, that goes to every bit of it. Um, yeah. All right. Awesome. So, what we like to do at, uh, at these clinics is open up to you guys so you guys can get exactly what you want out of this clinic. So if you have a question for any one of us, um, please direct that. Say, hey, uh, Dixon or Paige or somebody, and uh, we will uh, get that question taken care of. And if not, you want a general question, I'll, we'll, I'll feed it in and then I might ask one of our experts to answer that question and give you guys a really good answer. So, um, yeah, feel free to brainstorm a little bit and fire away. Who's got a question for us? So we have a question regarding balance and staying balance. I'm going to send this one over to Peter McBride. I think he is... Um, Peter has incredibly smooth form. He's, he's, he's very in tune with his body and he stays very balanced. So he can maybe give you some tips to, to help you there. Uh, I would say slow everything down and maybe try to film yourself. And then you can usually probably, you can usually tell what, uh, if your timing's off or if you're maybe stepping too far out or you're not stepping far out enough and you're leaning forward. 
but um, just slow it down and really focus on your footwork and make sure you're placing, placing it where you can rotate it, your upper body over and maintain your balance. Do you have any so. exercises that you do to stay balanced? Um, and could you demonstrate some, please? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, I do some stretching to work that out and also a decent amount of running and hiking because if, you're, if you're, uh, your legs are strong, they're gonna, you can really uh, trust them to rotate around them. Course. Who's got another question? That was a great one to start, and if we're done, then I mean we can just pack up. But we want to make sure we get everything for you guys, so don't be shy. Awesome. So, yeah. Repeat the question. Okay, so the question is: uh, staying calm during a tournament round. There's a big performance difference between casual feeling and tournament feel. Here's what we used to do: uh, me and a friend of mine up at Zebos. We, we, put, we called it dollars. You can call it quarters, whatever you want. We played $1 on the front nine, $1 on the back nine, $1 for the total amount. You can do it for a penny. Something. Put something on the line in a casual round, and it makes you take that casual round a little more serious, and what you start doing is blending your casual and your tournament together so that there's not this huge difference between the two. I hated losing a dollar to that guy more than I hated losing a national tour tournament. I did not want to lose a dollar to that guy. And so on my, on my casual rounds, I was taking it serious and I was bringing that tournament practice <clears throat> so that that's what I was practicing was my tournament mindset so that when I got to the tournament, hey, I, I'm beating him by five strokes. I don't care. Hey, it's just an easy walk in the park because I'm already feeling good about it because I practiced it. You're not going to be good at anything you don't practice. So you've got to practice that tournament mindset. And the way that I did that was just a little bit on the line every time. And it, and it, and it really brought both of us up so that we we're performing much better in tournaments. That's right. Good job, Bob. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've got more questions. We've got one down here. Yeah. Repeat the question. <laughs> um, essentially, just like how to throw it farther. Whoa. Yeah, I think for me, it's just like Peter said, with the balance, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, just slowing everything down and getting your timing on. I think timing is probably top three most important things in disc golf and especially in throwing farther. If your timing's off, you're throwing with just half of your body. So if your foot plants and then your arm comes through, all you're doing is using your upper body. So if you, for me personally, when I'm throwing my farthest is when my hip point is the same on my lower body and upper body. So I'm just, like if you have those resistance bands, you can just practice like when your elbow comes through with when your foot hits, um, or just do that. Like if I'm ever in a line at a grocery store or waiting on Tina at Joanne Fabrics or something, I'm just sitting there like this <laughs> over and over and over. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, just repetition, 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 get that timing down. And uh, uh, one more thing for the distance is like, try to explode. And like I said, use your whole body. A lot of my power I feel is coming from my legs. So I put a lot of my body weight in my back foot and power it onto the front foot and go through the disc. Um, just to add to that a little bit, um, really basic tip it might seem kind of obvious but I think it's something that a lot of people um, kind of forget about but your disc angles are extremely important and I think that's a big part of why she says to slow down because um, you're able to hit your angles more accurately if everything's moving slower if you're trying to rush into something um, it's a lot harder to get that exact angle you're trying to hit so the number one uh, distance killer is having that nose angle up just a little bit so just practice getting that nose angle down um, and it's unnatural for your wrist if you look, you know, this is the nose angle down and my wrist is like torqued over, but that's how to get the disc out flat instead of uh, nose up. Thank you. Great. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Yeah, yeah. What, we family feud over here? Yeah, good answer, good answer. <laughs> Show me potato salad. Um. <laughs> All right. Who's got some more questions that we can answer? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you when you pull on a hyzer, it just it kind of like goes and just falls. Yeah. Yeah. AJ, I think you got pretty good understanding of your disc angles. Do you want to do this one? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna pass this one on to AJ. 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 All right, AJ. AJ. Yes. Here's the disc if you need. Thank you. Matches your shirt. Uh, okay. So. 
you're wondering about throwing hyzers and different kinds of finishes to the second half of the shot. Now I think a lot of that kind of comes from the upper body and when we start the disc low to high you might get more of a, of a sweep. And if you're trying to get more of a stall, try high to high or just keeping it on like a flat, a flat table and you'll kind of punch through the air a bit more and then punch and then stall out a little bit instead of just gliding left the whole time as where you might. And that's, that's just um, muscle memory and building up the correct muscles that we use for disc golf. It just takes time to get used to being able to throw on that flat plane like this. Because when we start out, you know, we're not as strong holding the disc up in the air. You know, maybe you might make it like a few minutes before you start like shaking a little bit. And so what, ha what happens there is when we start out and our feet are not like, you know, you don't have the, the sweet dance moves to be able to make everything work. So when we start out, when I see a lot of people start out, they might do like a, a hop and then there they are down here because they're not, they don't have the muscles to get the disc up and then they do this and you get that sweep. So really just, just work on imagining like a, a table or a bar, you know, and you're just trying to come across nice and flat on this flat plane and really punch through the air flat instead of low to high. That's a good good place to start. I think Miles might admit no. Yes, yes no? Good okay. Yeah. That's great. Very nice. And feel free to ask multiple questions, guys. We don't want you guys to say one thing and think you guys are done. Um, really, really get everything out of this clinic because your question is also helping other players learn more and more about the game. Let's <laughs> repeat the question. Okay, uh, the question is what product do I use my hair? And the secret, I mean, the, the answer is none of your business. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later, it's a, it's a trade secret. Go for it, he's got another question. But what's your real question? I'm gonna send this one to Miles. He plays play a lot of good golf and you hit angles yeah. pretty well. I'm not, you can't golf. So, so, yeah. So the question is, he has a lot of early releases. It uh, feels like when he's, when he's coming across, the disc is just coming out early on him. Um, just by watching you reenact that, I'm guessing you probably keep your head up too high. Um, a lot of times if you pick your head up, your body doesn't know what to do, so you can end up early releasing it or pulling it. Do you have a lot of trouble pulling it too? Yeah, and so it's just like kind of ball golf or even baseball. You know, when you get in that, that swing, you got to keep your head down and let your body rotate through before your head comes up. So if you're having trouble with angles, be sure you're keeping your head down or on a fixed point as you pull through. Your head should be still. It shouldn't be turning all over the place because where does your body go? Where your head goes. So you want to make it static so that your body can move around your head. So. That's a great answer. Yeah. Good answer, good answer. Stay good in answer. the throw. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Let's hear it, Alex. Okay, uh, I'll, we'll get a couple answers here, but I'm going to start with this one because I, I have actually noticed. Um, uh, so he's asking uh, what happens in a tournament when your putting gets off? Do you change up what you, your routine or do you try a different putt? Um, and my answer is. I make sure that my body stays working the same. I may change my aiming point. I actually have a weird tendency uh, to, if I start pushing the disc to the right, because I really want that flat release, um, and I keep finding that I'm missing just a little bit right. It might be in my shoulders, but I just settle in and I'll actually go for a touch of a hyzer release, but my everything else is, feels the same. My reach back, my timing, my, my routine, stays the same. So I might just put a little bit of hyzer that helps correct me back to center. Um, that, that doesn't always work. I just feel it out during the tournament. I just make sure that I trust my putt and uh, give myself a chance. Changing the aiming point could be the biggest thing. If you find yourself missing low, just raise it up a little bit and keep your chin up. Anybody else want to add to that? AJ does. Okay. Uh, Eric said it and, and you also said it. Alex, uh, <laughs> you you mentioned uh, you, I'm just trying to remember 
rem remember his name and retain it. Uh, you guys both said the word routine, which to me I think is one of the most important parts of putting, is is having a a solid routine that you can replicate over and over and over, like down to the second, pretty much. One of my mentors always harped on me, you know, over and over. He said that Tiger Woods at his peak, when he was putting on the green, his putting routine was like exact, you know, within maybe half a second. And that's from when he, you know, picked up his, picked up his quarter behind the ball and set his ball down. 29 seconds exactly you know looking at it stepping up here doing this doing this doing this and this and this just perfect and so when i feel like i'm putting my best is when i have that routine that i can i've got you know bullet points that i go through from start to finish from when i when it's my turn to putt i'll put my mini down i'll take a few steps back inhale exhale a couple steps forward inhale exhale look down at my feet you know, inhale, exhale, and then approach it. And I don't really do a whole lot of like, th you know, this and this and this, but I have that routine that I can go back to and that I'm like very strict with it. And I think once you, once you make enough putts practicing, that's also a huge part of it. Um, once you make enough of those putts and you're able to replicate that, that physical activity, it also turns into mental activity that is super effective. So I'd say that that's one of the biggest keys to tournament putting for sure. Um, okay, Alex, so uh, if, so let's say you've, you've, you've already done, you're at the point of the tournament and you've already done all of this stuff, right? And you still feel like I couldn't hit water if I fell out of a boat, right? Because I, I mean, I've been there before, okay? So maybe something to try in that time, you know, do your normal routine, you pick out your link, you know what you want to do, you've thought about the wind, your feet are settled, step off, step in, putt. Just, just try something different, okay? Because you, it's, it's different, but it's the same. It's still your same everything. Your, your swing's the same, your motion's the same, but you're trying just something a little different to see if, because you, when you step up to that putt in the round and you think I'm terrible, you already feel like you're gonna miss it. So what difference does it make if you try something new, right? As far as, as far as the timing of your routine. So maybe when you get to that spot, just toss it, see what happens. You'll notice Big Germ does this on like his 10 foot putts. He tries to not think about it because he's got misses from 10 footers when he, think, when he overthinks it. So he just gets up there and bangs it and, and deals with it. So if you feel like you're a little bit off, head to your routine. If you've been heading to your routine for 15 holes and you still hadn't hit anything, Okay, roll the dice. What, you know, what difference does it make at that point? Right? Hey, Peter, man. Your turn. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> so, trusting your routine is huge. You can definitely uh, get your routine down and trust it. But it's also you're not having a bad putting day until you meant until you decide you're having a bad putting day. If you miss like three putts to start off your round, you could still go lights out and and shoot your best score on that round. You like. You don't don't define that day as bad, even if you have, even if you've missed nine putts in a row or something. Like just try to forget about it and move on and trust your routine and just think back on all the putts you've made in the past. Maybe think back to your happy place in your backyard or your local putting green and just just visualize you, yourself making those putts. And then you just got to believe in yourself. Yeah. Peter McBride, the most wise 21-year-old ever. Who's got some more questions? Totally. Giggler? You're great on the approach. <laughs> Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your response is going to be a throw slate. No. <laughs> <laughs> no Giggler, you got it. Come on. Yes, you can. There All right. You <laughs> um, he's going after me still, right? Yeah. I have a hard time with powering down. So for me, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on approach shots, whenever you're powering down, um, some what, what did, exactly did you say? that you have a hard time hitting your angles release or release points. Yeah, so for me, I have the same issue. Um, so when I power down I t I, and ease off a shot, I feel less confident hitting that angle. Um, so I won't power down, I'll just disc down um, and I'll throw it a little bit more nose up. Um, the benefit of slower discs is they glide more. So use the glide to your advantage, put them up in the air 
and let them float down. This also helps because it doesn't deviate horizontally, so you don't have to throw that spike hyzer in or the sidearm hyzer in. You can just throw it straight at your target the whole time. Again, something that helps big time in the woods back here. Um, so just maybe try a little more nose up, but still power it hard. So with that nose up, anytime you're having the nose up, you want more power so that it fights that wind, which is great. I, I would say th try a Marshall is my uh, opinion on that. Just goes dead okay. straight. You got something now? No, nah, that's basically the same. I'll do the same. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you. Yeah. All right. So. Slammer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Donald, Donald says throw the slammer. Um, so uh, throwing putters and powering down on discs is um, one of the strengths of my game because I don't throw as far as uh, a lot of the people out here. And so getting, getting close to the basket uh, from those shorter distances is really important for me. And uh, one thing that, I, that helps me a whole lot is um, when, I'm, when I'm going through my shot, uh, a tendency for a shorter shot is to do something like this where if I'm only throwing it 100 feet, then I just want my arm to kind of look, you know, just whatever. Um, instead of that, like you can slow your arm down but you still have to follow through. Like it's a full shot. I'm sorry if I almost hit you. No, you didn't. I was, I was, I was confident. <laughs> but it's still a full shot. So if you're watching someone on a short, even if it's a standstill, they could pull back to right here. Then I'll do that sometimes when it's just short stuff like that. But it's still going to come all the way across. You still want your body to look like you're actually throwing a shot. Stay, Dude, no, stay, there. Great. stay was, there. Stay there. I was confident. I'm a treat. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I think committing to that like acceleration is super important because your arm can still be slow and be like a shorter reach back here, but following through will still allow you to hit that angle and have the same timing. So that's something to try out for sure. I'm gonna add one extra bit to that. Uh, playing catch is a great way to get your approaching down. If you have somebody you can play catch with, with a softer disc or uh, we, Tina and I like to use the Latitude 64 bite and we really like to throw that disc because it's because it's great to play catch with and you start to understand well all right me to you all right cool easy it's just like playing catch i'm just going to throw it right to you and you you get a lot of repetition and you understand what happens when you throw discs on certain angles what happens when i super nose it up what happens if i spike it a little bit you start to see that and you get more confident in those shorter throws and you're getting a lot more extra throws. We will say playing catch helps your game across the board, but I think it really, really helps in the approaching. Awesome. All right. So we still got more questions out there. We still got some time. You guys are willing to ask. Okay. Anthony asks about timing. Whenever, how do you keep your timing for a 400 foot throw and a 100 foot throw? That's Peter. Um, super simple for me, I guess. If I have the space with my footing, I will still do the same run up, but just a really tiny version of it. So if I'm throwing a small upshot, I will still do my one step, even if it's tiny. So I'm getting the step into it versus my full power drive. You can run with me, ready? Yeah, I got you. Which is this, which is much bigger, but I'll still do it, but in a tiny, tiny version of it so that my timing and my footwork is all the same. Nice work, Paige. Teamwork right there. Um, that's my tip. Does that help? <laughs> Nobody? Ladies question, I guess. Um, so whenever I'm going down in distance, I'll throw, like I said, I have most of my body weight on my back leg on a drive. Um, nothing really changes when I'm throwing a shorter shot besides the amount of weight I'm putting here. If I'm throwing an approach, it's maybe like only like 40%. So that my arm's still the same, I'm just putting less weight and therefore power into the shot. Nice. Nice. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Who's got some more questions? All right, repeat the question. Let's do it. Yeah, you're next. Okay, so you're... Your question was regarding practice rounds versus tournament rounds, which are so similar but so different at the same time, right? And I think the, th the thing that I've learned um, that the diff there's a difference between the two is kind of like in a, in a casual round, you might go out and you know you're maybe not even wearing a shirt. You know, you, got, you may, might have like a few uh, icy cold bevs. 
as well. Um, and that kind of means you might think to yourself, well, I'm not, I don't really care about this because it's Tuesday afternoon and I'm just playing with my buddies, so I don't really care. As opposed to, you know, Saturday morning and now I got to make sure I'm at the players meeting and I'm dressed nice and I want to, you know, I want to play well. Well, the big difference there is you do care. And so you might think, well, I care about this, so now I've got all this pressure and now I'm all tensed up. But there's a big difference between caring and worrying. So now you think about that Tuesday afternoon round where you're out with your buddies just having fun. You're not worried about anything. So your, your mind is clear. You're able to access all those little subconscious things about your game that you might not really think about. But now when you're in a tournament situation, now then that worry starts to kind of creep in and take over. So that's the biggest difference that I've found is the difference between casual round and tournament round is the amount of worrying. So if you can eliminate some of that worrying, then you'll, be, then you'll see your, your game start to skyrocket. And the way to do that is to just remind yourself that you're a good golfer, that you've done it before. Because it looks like you know, you've got the bag and the shoes and the hat and the shirt that you've been playing for a while. I mean, it's all matching, the, the bag and the stool and the shirt and the hat. There you go. So that didn't, that didn't just happen overnight. That didn't just happen last week. You've, exactly, there we go. So you know how to throw a disc. You know, you know what it takes. You've done it before. Same with all of us. We've all done this a lot. Exactly. And so, you know, that's, that's one thing that is, is hard to do. It's hard to, um, it's hard to convince yourself sometimes because, you know, we all make mistakes and, and not every day is a perfect day. But if you can just remind yourself that, hey, I'm, I know what I'm doing. I've done this before. That kind of helps eliminate some of that worry. And so that, that's how you can kind of bridge the gap between casual round and tournament round. Great, great. Just one thing uh, to add to that. Um, accepting the type of golfer you're going to be on the day. Sometimes putting out your best is going to be 800 rated. And, that's a, and that might be great for you, it might be bad for you, whichever it is. Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes your best golf is 1,000 rated. And you know you can shoot those 1,000 rated rounds. And we get into that accepting our fate sometimes. And how do, and how do we change in those moments? You know how, as he says, your throwdometer, you, you've played the golf. So allow it to happen. Don't get, in the, don't get in the way of yourself. You got a question now? I like that one. We're going we're gonna to go down the line. Um, go to gas station snack. I, I, I'm a Red Bull guy, especially when we're doing longer drives. It's probably really bad for me, but I love Red Bull. Um, as a snack goes, I would probably say goldfish, but I haven't had enough of them, but I really like goldfish and, and Hershey's chocolate. Goldfish and Hershey's chocolate together. A bite a little bit of the other. Amazing. Don't knock until you try it. <laughs> Don't knock it until you've tried it, Robert. I will exclusively knock it. Yeah. You haven't tried it. Mine is... I tried it. Boom. Whatever. That's a world champ. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a snack, I guess. Um, for me, it's those little, like, snack pack things. They have, like, a hard-boiled egg, pretzels, and cheese in them. They're amazing. Yeah. Extra snack. Well, it's almost tax time. My tax guy told me, stop buying stuff at gas stations. So I haven't done that in a while, actually. I purposely don't bring my money into the gas station. So. Is that like a big chunk of your taxes? You know how much money you spend at gas stations? If you bought a snack every time you stopped? No. And I'll bounce for that. I've been to Bucky's with her. But the only thing I buy in gas stations is coffee to keep me awake behind the wheel. Lots of snacks I like those uh, they're like the cracker and cheese sandwiches like the club crackers I don't know yeah a little crack cracker and cheese yeah those are good Keebler yeah cream cheese and chives I just tried that the other day it was pretty good mine would probably be the blueberry crisp cliff bars Okay. Uh, everybody here is demonstrably wrong 
Uh, it is peanut butter M&Ms is really the only selection at a gas station. Thank you. Thank you. Peanut butter M&Ms. Oh, yeah. I mean, good yes, answer, peanut butter. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all week. I'm, I'm a fan of salted peanuts. That's why you get like that. It's nice and simple. Dr. Pepper and then Kit Kat for a little crunch. That's the way to go. I don't know about all these healthy people. You got, got time for that. If you're getting healthy food at a gas station, you've got other Right, right, yeah. Don't get healthy food at a gas station. At a gas station, not the point. Unless you're going to Bucky's or something. That's a whole different story. Isn't that right, Anthony? Next question. Who's got it? Go ahead. Go for it. Thumbers. Awesome. Who here throws thumbers? Is it just me? Okay. Okay. Uh, so when it comes to throwing thumbers, um, my, my only tip is understanding what the discs do. Now, you have the whole motion, and that, that's just about being athletic and being flexible. Um, an overstable disc on a thumber will hold its pan longer. So you can actually get more distance with an overstable disc because it wants to stay in the air and not flip as fast. Um, with an understable disc, you can do a quick flip thumber, which is actually pretty, pretty handy when you need it to get up and get right if you're a right-handed thrower. So you get it up there, it flips quick, and then drops and cuts itself to the right. That would be my best suggestion. Um, watching people throw those overstable ones, they really get them up high. So it has time to have that pan to get that extra distance. Does that help? Great question, man. That was awesome. Who's got some more questions? Okay, we'll go here and then we'll go to Scotty. Tomahawk? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I think, it's, it's, for the most part, I think it's the same, but I think Tomahawks, um, if you want it to cut left quick, I think it's the same. It's an understable disc, because you want that thing to get up there and quick flip. Now, try it out. We don't throw a lot of them, but from what, when I've had to, yeah, it's a utility stuff. But if you need it, and I, I the, the, the next part is, is don't, um, I, I did it on whole... 15, I believe, is the par 5 back in the woods. Um, I had a thumber to throw. I could have thrown a tomahawk. I could have thrown anything overhand. But I'm stuck back in the woods, and all I need to do is just pitch it out, and then I'll land in the bowl. That's a great spot to be. Now, I'm not trying to reach the basket. So understanding, all right, I'm already in the shul. This is not fun. Do I need to throw it really hard where I might end up in a bad spot again, or can I throw it smooth, nice and easy, let the disc be my friend, and land me in a good spot so I can try and throw a good shot from there. So slowing down and making sure you hit a good angle. Um, like he said, none of us really throw them. So I would say if you don't throw them as well, either practice them and learn, yeah. or don't throw it. If you're in a spot where you need a tomahawk or a thumber and you haven't practiced it, pitch out. You don't need to have a thumber, I promise. Like actual 18 or the tournament? Yeah. I would say try try some ground play, Texas, you know. That would be the one. Yeah. Slammer. Justin said slammer. Yeah, absolutely. Throw, throw a hyzer with an overstable disc. Maybe even use the ground and get a little skip, skip, skip um, with a really overstable disc, like an Audi or, uh, you know, anything super overstable like that. I mean, if you if you ever don't feel, not just tomahawk or thumber, if you ever don't feel comfortable with a given shot or don't know what it's going to do, just do the smart play. You don't have to get up and down at any given time, especially a hole 18. It's a par five, you know, people are taking sevens and you're probably still not gonna lose a stroke. So be okay with just pitching out until you fully learn that intended shot. So Scooby. Oh, that's nope. the man right there. Are you just going to give uh, general tips on Scoobies? Just Love it. There you go. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean grenade, yeah. right Scooby here. was a oh, Scooby oh. was a dog. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. Uh, different Scooby. No, what he's talking about, he had, he had a question about improving your technique for a Scooby or a grenade. Uh, basically, you're holding the disc upside down, put your thumb on the inside lip, and you throw it high, and it kind of does sort of like a thumber. Here you go. Here, let me have that. Sort of, sort of like a thumber or a tomahawk, but it tends to go more straight up and straight down. 
I mean, you kind of hold it like this upside down. And your technique, a lot of people struggle with it when they first start because they do their normal throwing motion. You remember, I think it was AJ talked about hyzers and how you throw different angles on hyzers. It's the same thing, except with the Scooby, you're not just reaching down and throwing up like a tall hyzer. You need to start a lawnmower. You know, the old, the old dance move? You're reaching down and throwing that thing straight up in the air as high as you can because you get distance with it by throwing it high. And so different discs, understable discs can sometimes flip up and go back right. Overstable will go left, kind of a neutral disc, straight up, straight down. But you really need to practice on reaching down, almost like you're trying to reach down for your shoe and then pull it straight up in the air. It feels very awkward when you first start, but once you get used to it, you can hit holes and gaps that people can't even fathom. And so it's really, really useful. Did that answer your question? No. I'd like to offer a disclaimer to this real quick. Um, <laughs> So the very first time, so me and my, or over at Zebos, there was a hole that a, that a, a Scooby was a great idea. So I thought, I'm tired of parring this hole. I'm going to throw the Scooby. This is actually a prosthetic thumb from the first time I threw a Scooby because it literally fell off. Okay, when you throw a Scooby, if you notice Eagle when he throws a Scooby on on video, he wraps his thumb in tape every time and then takes it off every time because when you throw this thing, here hold this for a second. That throwing motion rips down your thumb. So I just want you to know before the first time you throw it that it's going to hurt that you have not trained your thumb to deal with that. So if you really want to learn how to do it, you're going to have to fight through that. I was not terribly interested, and I've only thrown it one time in my life. Uh, and I'm not going back. I don't care if I bogey this hole because I'm not throwing that shot again. His thumb is desensitized, and he can do it. Mine, I like to use it. Yeah, even, even though my, I'm used to it, I still only do it four or five times if I'm working on it. Like, I don't, it's not like field work. You can just throw 200 shots in a row. You can't do that. you got to take your time. I don't know what Eagle's problem is. I don't tape my thumb. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you're in, so. you know. All right, we're going to go for about one more solid question. So who's got it? Who wants it? Unless we have a couple more that want to ask. Ben. So, so I, I'm gonna psh, get out of here. You don't throw sidearms. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm gonna take this one because this is actually what I worked on okay, because I didn't have much of a sidearm. Uh, so he's asking why you see pros, especially um, less pros who stand up when they throw sidearms, they get low. Why is that? Um, I worked on a sidearm during an off season, and that was the only way for me to throw smooth, accurate lines. Uh, watching uh, pretty strong sidearm players like Nate Sexton and Jeremy Colling, I was watching what they were doing, and I analyzed their form a little bit, and they stay really low. And why that is, is it allows them to release the disc on hyzer. So they're, out, they're able to take more understable, understable stuff and allow it to flip up for them. They're allowing the disc to work with them, not against them. When we come over the top, we're working against the disc, and we're allowing it to fight out. When we're throwing smooth, accurate shots slow, we're allowing the disc to naturally stand up, naturally glide, and go where we want it to go. So staying low allows you to keep your body together. When we talk about our backhand drive, we stay really compact and we explode. If I'm up here, I can't explode from my hips. I can do some, but it's all going into my arm, my elbow, and my shoulder. We can't, you can't throw those types of sidearms for 18 holes. Your body can't do it. You're going to be fatigued, and you're going not, not to be able to play a two-round tournament that is over one day. You can't do it. Your body physically can't, because that's why pitching counts in, in baseball. They, they get up to, you know, if they're up to closer to 100 throws, they're pulled out. So we, you have to be able to protect your body. By getting low, it allows you to engage your legs and engage your core a little bit more by staying in here and when I'm exploding from here. Look how compact I am as I'm coming through. And I'm coming through here and I'm allowing my hips to now be involved to help drive everything going forward. Um, I've talked with, when I talked with Jeremy Colling asking about distance discs, he said, well, you know, the 
farthest throwers are going to be the guys who take stuff and they work them over because that's what Simon Lazat does for backhands. He takes a PD2, it's a very overstable disc, and he comes over the top and he throws that thing forever and it never stops flying. Where that's going to be the same concept for side uh, for sidearms. But when you need to be accurate and you need to throw a fairway shot, you need to throw a golf shot, being able to put something on hyzer and let it be and work for you is going to allow you to be more accurate, save on energy, and be more efficient on the course. Yep. Nailed yeah. it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we want to thank you guys. Um, please feel free to sometimes come up and ask questions after the rounds and stuff like that when we have some time. If you guys see us at the players' party, I think most of us will be there. Um, come talk to us if you guys want to ask a more personal question you didn't want to ask today. And uh, I'll, I'll put this up to myself, and these guys can say if they want. Please reach out uh, to me on Facebook or social media if you guys have any questions after this that come up. I want to help you any way I can in uh, achieving the things you guys want to do in disc golf. Um, last bit, big thanks to the Waco Disc Golf Association and the guys who put on this event and allowing us to be here, and allowing for this great event to happen. That's a really, really big, uh, a big deal for disc golf to keep growing and having big tournaments to showcase great places like this and to showcase that disc golf is the real deal. So make sure you guys continue to support your local businesses that support disc golf. So check out all the sponsors who sponsored this event. Go buy, go get, go get a snack, go get something from them to show them that and tell them, hey, we're here for the disc golf tournament. We appreciate what you guys are doing. That, that is a great way to help our sport to continue to grow and be the great thing that we want it to be. So thank you so much, guys, and be dynamic.